All right, just think this is working. Good. <coughs> so, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, a more reasonable 9.30 hour than, than 8 o'clock. So hopefully you had your coffee. You're all nice and awake. So um, as James just mentioned, uh, my name is Jim Del Grosso. I work for Sigital. I've been doing software development for a little over 20 years and more or less the last 15 or so. I've been focused on software security. And for the last eight at Sigital, I've been focusing entirely on um, helping companies identify flaws in the designs of their system. So uh, that's kind of uh, my background. Uh, one of the things I'm presenting here, though, is as the role of executive director for the IEEE CSD initiative. So what is the IEEE CSD initiative? <coughs> um, Kathy Clark Fisher, um, who was the lead editor for uh, the Security and Privacy magazine for the Computer Society of IEEE, wanted to start a new initiative. And she wasn't exactly sure what she wanted to do, so she reached out to some folks that have done a lot of work with IEEE. Um, and she reached out to Gary McGraw and Carl Landwehr, and they kind of tossed around some ideas and said, what are the, what's one of the bigger problems that's not being solved by the industry today? <clears throat> and what they decided to focus on was this idea of identifying and preventing flaws. So it's surprising the large number of folks out there, maybe not in this audience, uh, but folks that, are, uh, that, we, that we work with that don't really get the difference between bugs and flaws. So just very quickly, I just want to spend a couple minutes and make sure we're all on the same page. We talk about the universe of defects in software, and they pretty much get split 50-50 between bugs and flaws. Just, we'll see if everyone's hands work today. Who knows, the, can, does everybody know the difference between bugs and flaws? The IEEE CSD initiative. Couple hands work. All right, so awesome. what is the IEEE so CSD initiative? On the <coughs> bug side, um, Kathy uh, Clark Fisher, bugs. we have um, things like was the lead editor Buffer Overflow for uh, the uh, Security and Privacy magazine is just written a new initiative. in a dangerous way. And she and wasn't exactly sure what she wanted to do, so she reached out to some folks that have there done a lot of work with IEEE. Uh, design flaws. Um, and she reached out uh, these to these are not going to be McGraw very different. These are very different than And they kind of tossed around some ideas. And even though the requirements might sound pretty good, make sure your laptop has a cable by the industry today. Uh, people will implement <coughs> that and control what they decided to focus all kinds on of crazy ways. was this idea so of I kind of like identifying from real life and preventing there flaws. was a control so with IT that said you had to have your laptops the cable large locked. number of folks no one actually said not have audience, to. Uh, but so folks that are table legs uh, that, we, the table, that we work with they don't locked. really get the just difference something. between we bugs and flaws so just very quickly software where the control is of course you could do input validation that's not the ideal way to find access that's occurring we really want to do the appropriate much but there is definitely encoding when the data goes back and out and bugs, back to the browser. There's an awesome reference today. article on the OWASP website called the you know, XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet. Who's heard of the XSS hands hands Prevention Cheat Sheet? It's good, excellent. And we have moved now side. to the um, first two OWASP tools that I want to mention to you. Number one is the OWASP Enterprise Security Awareness. And see what we can do when some default comes what you find flaws that she reached out to some folks. So that was how this that started. There are a lot of work with IEEE. Uh, so before I get into what our, uh, these are not uh, what our findings were, very different, our initial work, work, very different than just a little bit of some bugs. ideas. And, and so even what though there are more, what's one of the bigger problems, make sure like not being solved by the industry Everyone should be very familiar with and what they decided to focus on was this idea of kind of identifing from real life preventing the flaws. If you take a look at this, so anybody see any, any kind of surprising, the large number of phones that have been blocked frequently, but folks that are table legs that we work with, they don't really get the difference between bugs and flaws, and very quickly, software where the control is weak. You can do interact validation, that's not the ideal way. Maybe it's too fine, there are certain things that are so We really want to do the appropriate, but there is a put encoding when the data goes back out and back to the browser. There's an awesome reference article on the OWASP website called the XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet. You've heard of the XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet? And we can go down to the first two Prevention Cheat Sheets. Good, excellent. We move up now side, to the I'm first two OWASP tools that I want we to mention to you. Number one is we're not getting any better at it. Right? We continue to make the same kind of mistakes. So this was, uh, again, this was just kind of interesting. I did this after <coughs> uh, the, the CSD initiative, and I was, I was more kind of surprised. Uh, findings uh, were different. Our initial work was very different. And the sad talk history of my ideas. Haven't really made and said, much progress. Even though there's one of the bigger problems to fix something like not being something that's in the display. 
Everyone should be. So, <coughs> what are some of the common side effects? Most of the time, it's a great idea. Right? Yeah. 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 Like yeah. 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 But we still, still there has to be very quickly software where the control uh, is really You can do intraday, and that's not the to ideal make this way. A little bit uh, time there are some things that are very hard. We want to do the appropriate much. There is a lot of encoding when the data goes back out. And of course, the reality is we know about this for a lot more than just on the website. Right? The difference is a prevention cheat sheet. We sort of want to assess prevention cheat sheets. And if you look at the first two different cheat sheets, which is good, talks about and we are going to go to the first two tools that I want you to use. Number one is we're actually quite a while. Better at it. So it's right. It's not new. Continue to make the same kind of mistakes. It's been it's been known about. So this was just haven't made the progress. Again, this was just kind of interesting. We should have. We should have made. And so that leads to this idea that knowing about the problem doesn't really help us solve the problem. And the knowledge of the problem is really made on much progress. So we have to do something different to fix it. So even though it's not so bad, even though we may have checklists, even though we may have really good documentation to describe what the problem is, that I think now is that we're not just not moving forward in the right way. It's a lot of years. So in April, the CSD initiative started in late 2013 as the idea. In April of 2014, we held our first workshop. We invited a number of firms to take this a little bit. And the idea was everyone had to bring something to the And of course, however, the reality is, we know about the reference If it was internal reviews, great. If it was some sort of data source, it's great. 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 It's great flaws that you were recognizing in software that you reviewed. So that was the data that, that each of these firms um, and universities and, and government kind of agencies brought to the table. Uh, so everyone brought their own information. Nobody knew who else was coming. So it was all everyone's own, in, uh, own information. And basically, we took and that information and about the problem, and we discussed it for really a day and a half. Um, for those, first of all, just again, show you who, who's actually downloaded. Or so even though we have checklists, even though we may have checklists, as part of this presentation, we have the link to it, so you can certainly go download it. Everything that's being created is being created with the Creative Commons application. You can use it for commercial purposes. You can use it for not on commercial purposes, however you choose to use it, it's up to you. Uh, we invite uh, these were the, uh, the folks that participated the idea in the first workshop. Everyone had to bring um, many of these, uh, many of these participants, again, brought the flaws that they were catching through internal reviews. So this is another kind of important point about some of this data. The, the data that was presented isn't ever going to show up in any other type of list because it gets caught by internal reviews. The mistakes are being made, right? These, these types of flaws that we're gonna talk about, uh, they are being made by these organizations. They're being caught by internal reviews, internal design reviews, internal threat modeling activities. Different firms have different words um, for what it is they do. But this was caught uh, for some of these firms by internal reviews. Um, others are what they uh, had read through industry uh, research. So again, it was, it was kind of a mix of where this data came from. Uh, but we took what everybody had presented, kind of laid it out on a table. Everybody talked uh, in their own way about the flaws that they found within their organization or university or, or whatever. Um, and we kind of congealed it into 10 common problems, 10 common design flaws. So that's where this data came from. It was real data from real companies, from real organizations. So what, what are the top 10? And again, these are not in any kind of an order. Uh, there, there, wasn't, there were, in fact, some companies that specifically said, uh, these are not in any order to us. We're just going to tell you, the, you know, the, the five, the seven things, uh, eight things that we see. And what we did is we talked about them as a group. And we just said, here are the 10, <coughs> uh, the 10 common flaws that are being identified. And these should be on the list. There was enough, you know, enough critical mass that enough of the participants were seeing these types of flaws, so they made it onto the list. I'm not going to read these to you. You can read them yourself, and of course, you can download these.
But as you look at these, again, these are well-known problems. There isn't, hopefully, anybody here that doesn't you know, think client-side trust is, is a design flaw, right? This is, a, this is an issue with, with software. If you look at the bottom two, um, that ties quite nicely into one of the top you know, OWASP injection attacks, right? Screwing up your data and control is the universe of injection attacks. But these are being caught through design reviews in many organizations, preventing lots of instances of different types of injection attacks from happening. Um, again, just, well, of course, authorize after you authenticate. Nobody purposely does this, and yet this was happening in enough places where it's caught by internal review that it's not being done correctly, that it made the list. Again, this was kind of telling information that these types of flaws are routinely being caught by internal review and by very capable companies with very capable you know, dev, dev shops. So something about this is a bit more challenging than we're giving you know, credit for. <coughs> so again, another, uh, another set of five, um, which is, uh, again, as you look at some of these, again, some of these are, are hopefully pretty obvious. Uh, crypto um, is done incorrectly <coughs> very frequently. It's very hard to get this right. The APIs are, are very easy to use, and it's very easy to misuse because the developers don't have the security training <coughs> to really understand the nuances of if I, if I pick certain you know, primitives or do something uh, with certain protocols, I'm going to make myself vulnerable to certain types of attacks. It's not their domain knowledge. Right? They, having an easy API to use that's hard to get right is exactly not what we should be having. Uh, some of the other, uh, some of the rest of these, again, uh, kind of roll back into an organization of uh, how, it, what is sensitive data to your organization? Do you have a data classification model? Um, understanding um, what's sensitive for one app might not be sensitive for another app. Um, having that kind of information inside the organization is critical <coughs> in order to avoid some of, uh, some of these flaws. Um, and again, we'll look at a couple of examples of, of these. Um, but this was, again, this is the list. Uh, this is the list of the 10 and what made it into the, into the top 10 list. So as, as you may have scanned these 10, or <clears throat> if you read the 10 online, <clears throat> you may have said, I feel like it's the, you know, the little gecko who's saying, yeah, everybody knows you can, you can you know, we know about these things. And I agree for the most part that there is a huge audience that knows about this, but this is where we are. So we're constantly making the same kinds of mistakes, even though we know about these problems. We, we, we know exactly what the problem is. Our, our real problem is we don't seem to have a good solution for preventing them. And so what the CSD <coughs> is going to try to do, well, not try to do, we're going to do it, um, is we're going we're gonna to provide the, the kind of guidance on how to avoid these flaws. Now, what you're going to see up on the site is not there yet. Again, we had our initial workshop, workshop in 2014. Um, but as we move forward over the next couple of years, that is exactly what we're going to do. We want to, we want to make it um, more challenging to allow a developer to make these kinds of mistakes. We don't want these flaws to exist. So we recognize that there are organizations that may not be able to do threat modeling or they may not be doing design reviews, but can we create something for them that still helps them avoid these common flaws? We think the answer to that is yes. And we'll be working on that over the next couple of years. So just to pull out a couple of, couple of examples. <coughs> so one of the flaws was to use an authentication mechanism that uh, cannot be bypassed and tampered with. Um, there's a lot of examples. Um, I'll just show you three quick pictures before I start talking. Everyone has kind of seen this one, I think. This is a well-known picture. If you were narrowly focused and you were on the road looking at the gate, you may think that, okay, there's a gate here and that's my control, I can't get past it. And again, in designs and in software, we see this occasionally, where the design looks good if you're looking at a very small piece of the problem, but if you take a step back and look at the entire you know, software ecosystem, there are ways to get around it. There's other types of design flaws where you know, maybe the control is great in some spots, but in other parts, the control is not so great. And so as an attacker, of course, we're gonna go work on the weakest part. As a defender, we can't have that. Right? We can't have stuff like that. And then there's nonsensical stuff where the control is there, but it's, it's really just there for show. It's not truly effective. You just go around it. 
It's, that one's sort of like the first one, just another example. Everyone has heard, I assume, of the I, iCloud breach. So it's kind of, I thought it was kind of funny that they were complaining about iCloud being, you know, Apple and iCloud being the problem when it's the users who were putting all the information that identified themselves in the public space and then they bitched that people were able to guess my secret answers when I made it publicly available and that's somehow the manufacturer's fault, but whatever. There's, there's, there still needs to be this authentication mechanism that we want to make difficult or challenging to bypass. Now, what gets interesting when you start going into, into this space is what is the business trying to do, right? You've got real usability concerns. Um, sure, you can do things like multi-factor authentication, but if you're gonna make multi-factor authentication a part of your you know, design control for proving who your users are, uh, you've gotta kind of balance that with I can't piss off my users. It's kind of interesting from this morning's talk, uh, what was it called, the switching, the switching cost. If I irritate my users and I make the authentication mechanism for a, for a competing product and it's much simpler than mine to use, as a user, what might I be inclined to do? I might be inclined to go for easy even though it's inferior. So you do have to, I mean, this is the real headache that we have to deal with. But still, from a, from a purely, you know, right thing to do, being able to bypass the authentication control is not what we're shooting for, right? That should not be possible. One of the other common flaws um, is this whole notion of separating uh, data and control and not allowing, <coughs> excuse me, these injection tax, uh, attacks to occur. Um, there is a, there's a good paper that was just released uh, in September of this year by uh, Christoph Kern from Google. And it's a very interesting example of what they did in Google. I encourage you to go read it. It, it may not be right for you, but it's really, really interesting for the following reason. What they did <coughs> was they took, um, they took a number of their internal apps that were already done pretty well, um, but they had still found a number of instances of cross-site scripting attacks. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to see if they could build a framework that developers were okay with using. So that was an, uh, to me, that was a really important piece of the puzzle. They needed developer buy-in that, yes, we will use this framework if you build it for us, right? The worst thing to do would be build a security framework that nobody wants to use. That's not helpful. So they built this framework um, with developer buy-in, and what they did was they architected it in such a way so that the possibility of a cross-site scripting attack occurring was limited to a very small path through this framework. By limiting the possibility for where cross-site scripting could occur, they have basically gotten rid of, whereas they were finding N before they did this, they are now finding zero. Does it mean there's none there? No, of course not. <laughs> Absence of finding a bug does not mean there's no bugs. But when you're finding stuff using one technique and you change your design and that drops to zero, that's really interesting, right? That is the kind of model that maybe makes sense. We're creating a framework for developers to use to make it harder for the defect to ever occur in the first place. That is a design that, is a design that you want to achieve, right? The developer is still developing the code the way they know how to develop code. We have uh, you know, security folks involved with the creation of this framework to make it more difficult for some of these defects to ever show up in the first place. And you wipe out many, many instances of bugs by modifying your design. Cool model. Right, that seems to be the right model. So again, I encourage you to go read it. Uh, see if it makes sense for your environment. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting way to approach the problem. And I think this is the right approach for other types of problems as well. So, using crypto right. Um, again, as I said, uh, my day job is, is working for Sigital and, and I run the architecture analysis practice. I work with companies doing architecture analysis. This is a huge, um, this is a huge thing that's done incorrectly all the time. This is very hard to get right. And so just to show two examples, one of which does not belong here and one of which does, these are two examples where crypto was used correctly. Which one does not belong here? Because we're talking about flaws. Which one? 
Heartbleed. Somebody says Heartbleed. Yeah, Heartbleed doesn't really belong here. That's a bug. There was a bug in the code. Right? The code was written incorrectly. And so that is a good example of an implementation a bug, but not really something that we're, we're talking about, at least not when we talk about getting crypto right. Uh, triple handshake, that's a flaw in the protocol design. Right? There's a flaw in the way the TLS handshake works. And if an attacker can do the right thing and insert themselves into, that, into the handshake, they cause the client to think that they're really talking to the server when in fact they're not. Total, total flaw, flaw in the design of the protocol. That's this, that's this universe. Now, these are complicated examples, but if you think about more, you know, more conventional flaws in systems, not having, not having a design to deal with key rotation, not having a design to deal with key compromise, not having a design to change encrypted data. These are design flaws, but we see them all the time. People encrypt data, it's secure, and it's confidential, and it's tamper-proof, and it's great until something bad happens and they don't have a design in place to deal with when something bad happens. That's wrong. Something bad will happen. It will probably happen at 2 a.m. in whatever time zone you're in, and it will be an in inopportune time. You're getting ready to go on vacation tomorrow, and that's when this bug will, that's when this thing, that's when this flaw will manifest itself. So we want to think about these uh, types of problems um, at the design level and, and plan for that, and how does it how does, it, how, does it, how, know, how does our design need to change to address some of this? So again, if you go and look at uh, the write-up, it's really, it's very high level at the moment, but it's really hitting all the key points that you need to be thinking about if you're going to be using crypto in your system. All the things that have to do with key rotation, you know, proper, proper use of algorithms, how are you going to deal with compromise? You have to be thinking about those. And if your design doesn't address them, you possibly <laughs> or probably are setting up for a problem down the road. Again, this gets back to the, I wasn't doing this yesterday, uh, so why do I need to do it today? It's because, it's, because, it didn't, because I wasn't in an accident yesterday doesn't mean I'm not gonna be in an accident today. Right? This can still happen. So getting a design to address the known types of flaws that we, we do know about and that are occurring in, in lots of organizations seems to be the right thing to do. So, <clears throat> Another example. Again, there's this identifying of, of sensitive data. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, one of the one of the problems that we we see and, and other organizations brought to the table was um, within different business units, within different parts of organizations, what is sensitive data varies uh, between the different business units. One business unit may treat something like a session ID as is you know sensitive. Another one doesn't care about such a thing. Security might mandate what's sensitive and what's not. Uh, some piece of PII information might be sensitive, whereas in another organization, all of, those, all of those pieces of information are not relevant to their line of business. These are, these are problems within an organization that you have to solve, but from a designing a system, you actually have to know what your policy is ahead of time so that you're actually building the controls into your software to not violate any of your principles. Right? If I'm trying to protect sensitive data, what does that mean? Is it, is it sensitive because it's sensitive to the business? Is it sensitive from a security point of view? Is it sensitive for some other reason? But you have to, f you have to figure out what that means for the context that you're manipulating this data. And a lot of that, as it turns out, doesn't exist, uh, which is kind of weird. Because uh, the folks that do the scanning at the very end complain when sensitive data gets put somewhere that it's not supposed to, but they were not involved on the far left to let you know that you shouldn't be doing it, which is kind of weird. It's like, I'm going to bitch about stuff after you've done it, which is a weird model. We should maybe do it earlier in the cycle. Uh, another one, always consider the user. So this is a little excerpt uh, right from the, the write-up up, up on the website. And if you just read the, uh, the second sentence uh, to yourself, it's right from, if it is difficult. So I know there are companies out there that make it difficult on purpose because they want you to reveal more information, which is good, good for them. But if you're actually worried about your users, trying to make this very clear and understandable in plain English to the users to understand when you pick this option and it has some security you know, effect, you as the user should know what it means. It's a, it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice model. It's the feel-good model. Uh, if I'm going to present the choice to the user, it should be very clear what that means. 
So here are two dialogues on some website. You un probably can tell who it is, but it really doesn't matter who it is. So if you read these, <coughs> select who can see your list of connections. Only you, your connections. How many people think only you means only you? You are incorrect. <laughs> only you does not mean only you. Only you means only you and the people you have a direct connection with. Your connections means everybody that happens to have any connection with you can see any connection of them. That is not what this says. <laughs> and I'm in security. I, I know English reasonably well. That is not what this says. Only me means only me. That is not what only you means. This is, at, this is backwards. <laughs> right? Now, I get that you may want to do this for certain business reasons, again. But when you're thinking about the user and we're talking about security controls, you know, burying it in, in weird dialogues and weird flows, and if you pick this option over here, it negates this option over there, this is not right. Not if you actually care about your users. Not if you actually care about trying to give the user the ability to secure their data. You can't have stuff like this, right? We, we need to be clear, we need to be concise. We need people to understand what does it mean when they start to pick some of these choices. So thinking about the users is kind of an interesting uh, security control to get right because if we let users shoot themselves in the foot, it's actually better for us. We, can actually, we actually can lean back and say, look, I gave you the option to secure yourself. You chose not to. You didn't want to put a password, you know, passcode on your, on your mobile device, and then you complain that somebody picked up your phone and, and bought stuff on Amazon because everything was auto-logged, and that, that's on you. Right, that, that's, that's you. But if I make it so convoluted that you don't really know what you're, what you're approving or what you're allowing, that's kind of on me. Right, that's on us, the designers. We shouldn't be doing that if that's not our intent. So again, just <clears throat> another example. So uh, this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually a, a new addition in 2013, right, to OWASP Top 10, is starting to think about how external components change your attack surface. And we will, in fact, resurrect this one here, because now it does make sense, right? If you were using this inside of your ecosystem, uh, even though the actual heart bleed defect was a bug, it's a piece of software that I was using. It's a component that I was using inside of my environment. Did anybody here get bit by heart bleed? I mean, where you had to change your, your software? Because of, the, uh, because of the, the bug? A couple of head nods. I know we had some folks that were up many a late night trying to deal with this because it's all happening live, right? The, the, the bug was known. There, there is no fix. What are you supposed to do? Well, the whole point of, of this you know, flaw to avoid is you need to have a design in place, a process, a procedure in place for when this happens. This has happened many, many times in the past. It will happen many times in the future. So we know that there's going to be problems with the software that we bring into our code and to our systems. When that fails in some way, sometimes in spectacular fashion, we want to have a plan to bypass it, replace it. <clears throat> Can we do something else? Do we bump up monitoring? Oh, we do something, right? There's something that you have to have in your design to deal with how your attack surface changes based on the software that you're bringing in. Now, this is just one example. Uh, there's other examples that just because I'm bringing in a piece of software, um, it really does change the risk to my app because it, it has more features than maybe I would like, but those features are now available because the code is there, right? A vulnerability in that piece of code makes those features available. Are there things I can do? Can I disable those features? These are all the kinds of things that we ought to be thinking about um, when we're designing our software and pulling in these components from lots of different places. Each component that we bring in somehow changes our risk profile, right? It, it makes some, maybe some features available or it introduces new risk or we have to understand exactly how to configure things. This is all the kind of stuff that we have to be thinking about when we're pulling down this great new piece of code that has some functionality we want. It may have the functionality you want and it may have nine other pieces of functionality you don't want but you don't really have that option to disable those. So it's good to be thinking about that. So another, another one, just to kind of 
expand on, which was one of the identified, uh, the identified flaws, which was um, basically when we're thinking about um, changes to objects and actors, how is our software gonna, gonna change as those things change? And I don't know, it seems like the, the one good example that I could come up with was <clears throat> we gotta roll back maybe, I don't know, five, seven years. You know, we had applications that ran historically in, a, in some sort of a data center environment. Uh, mobile came on the scene, and if anyone remembers some of the initial mobile apps, um, it, was, it was not a good experience. We seemed to go back about 10 years in software security, making mistakes about client-side trust, uh, storing data in, in bad ways. Uh, so we made a lot of the mistakes that we had made 10 years prior to you know, the moving of apps to the mobile world. Um, and I can only imagine what the Internet of Things is going to bring upon us. Probably the same problems all over again because there's going to be this rush to market. Uh, we're going to do things in most likely insecure ways, but we got to get to the market first. Um, so that was kind of one example. And of course, there's a, a, a big push for moving applications to the cloud because it has lots of benefits. Well, there's also some negatives, right? It changes, uh, it certainly changes our attack surface. Um, it's hard to secure some things in an ecosystem that we don't control, right? We heard about this this morning, in fact. Um, where you don't own the universe where your application's running. You have a certain level of trust that you, you just accept. You may have SLAs and you may have some other things in place that you have some sort of a guarantee, but at the end of the day, it's your brand, it's your name, it's your applications that are running inside of these new, these new ecosystems. And it's putting your applications, your brands, your customers' data at risk. So as things move to the cloud, <coughs> um, you know, lots of interesting problems. Can we prevent cloud admins from, from getting to the data? Maybe. Depends on the cloud, on the cloud provider. Um, as the data sits up there and, and things are getting replicated all, all for me, what, is, what does that do? What if I didn't want some of this sensitive data replicated you know, nine different ways across ten different regions? Uh, that changes how you design uh, some of your cloud infrastructure. So just understanding um, how things are, are moving through different ecosystems, how New, new, well, we call them threat agents, uh, could be misactors, attackers, whatever word you're comfortable with. As you change where the software is running and how things are deployed, who's attacking the software starts to change. Thinking about that ahead of time is kind of important. So, for those that haven't been to it, that's the URL uh, to get to the cybersecurity initiative. Um, it's Again, it's, it's all open. Uh, what, where are we going next? Uh, great question. Uh, we are having uh, another workshop uh, early next year, and then we'll actually have several more. So the idea is, you gotta remember, when this thing started, we, we weren't even sure if people were gonna show up and we were gonna see you know, 10 snowflakes or we were gonna see some common things. It turns out there weren't 10 snowflakes. There was some common, there was some common stuff. And we wanted to write down what we all discussed. And that's what's up there now. The next step is to be, get more actionable advice. And so we're going to take what we have and we're going to continue to build so that as somebody reads, you know, how do I, how do I actually get <coughs> uh, a design so that it's not possible to bypass authentication? There will be, um, there will, there will be some documentation up there to give you some ideas on how to do that. If you're interested in joining, it's completely open to the public. Um, on the Get Involved page, you can email uh, the CSD. It'll ultimately trickle into my box. <laughs> and I'll keep, you, uh, I'll keep you in the loop. Uh, we're, it's, it's very early as to what, it, what this is really going to look like. Uh, we're the ones that are going to be deciding what this looks like. We know that there's a problem. right? Of this, of this we're certain. We're making the same mistakes over and over again. So we're pretty sure there has to be a solution to this. There's no way that what we're doing should stay the course. It's been 10 years. It's pretty much time to say enough is enough. So 10 year decade seems like we've had our fun. Now we should stop the nonsense, right? So we can, we can basically change um, how we design software if we really think about these problems ahead of time and actually make our software less vulnerable to these well-known attacks. Again, these are well, well-known problems that are occurring in lots of organizations. I think 
there are plenty of organizations out there that aren't looking for these types of problems. And so there will be organizations that, <coughs> that say, well, you know, we don't have that problem. And it's, it's kind of hard to, to buy that if you're not looking for them. <laughs> if you're looking for them and you're not finding them, you, ca you get to say something like that. If you're not looking for the problem, you really don't get to say, we don't have an authentication bypass problem. <laughs> How do you know? How do you know <laughs> that you don't have a problem? You gotta look for this stuff. And so those are some of the other things that we wanna push forward. You know, if, if you look at uh, the tooling and you know, checklists and just you know, some, of the, some of the other things that are out there to help with pen testing and code review much further ahead than what we have on the design side of things. Again, for us, we call it the threat modeling space. So it's, uh, it's, it's way behind, in, in, in my opinion. And so we want to try to use this platform to maybe start to shrink that, that delta and not, not get it so far behind. So maybe we can come up with some tooling. Maybe we can come up with some standard language even for, so that we're all talking the same language. That would be, that would be epic. Uh, that would be nice. Um, but that's where basically where we're headed, what we're trying to get to. Um, again, you can, uh, you can download an electronic copy of the report. Uh, you can read it online, of course. You can download a PDF. Um, if you want, uh, we have a booth here. Uh, swing by the booth. There's, uh, there's copies there. If you actually just want to bring a copy and, and hand it to your boss, try to convince them that uh, you should be doing more on the architecture analysis side, looking for these flaws that do exist. And if you're not looking for them, it, you, you are the accident waiting to happen. Uh, you're more than welcome to go there. Uh, if you want to ping me, I'll be, at, uh, I'll be at our booth, you know, today from 2 to 5. You can bug me. You can bug me then. You can hit me in the halls, bug me anytime you want. Uh, we have an event. Uh, where is it? Over at uh, Ignite Burgers at 7.30 tonight. You want to swing by, have an informal chat about this. Love to talk about it, get ideas. Again, this is, this is driven by the public. It's IEEE. It's all public. It's a global thing. If you know somebody in another country that wants to get involved, have them come to the site. Uh, it was really to, you know, this, this, the secure design initiative was to get awareness up and then to build some artifacts that will help people stop making these mistakes. So the only way we're going to do that is if we have a lot of folks, a lot of input telling us these are the kinds of things that are working for you, some of the stuff that's not working for you, and then we can go from there. So that was uh, all that I had. Um, it's a small enough group. Has anybody got any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, they, they will be. I mean, I modified these, you know, like this morning per usual. So I will get them to Laura Grau, and then if the slides are available, are the normal OWASP slides available somewhere? One had not, yeah. I'm, I would imagine they are, so they will be. Whatever the OWASP rules are, yeah. So you mean like a, like a best practices of, of, of what to do, but from a design point of view? Yeah. So we're, we're going to be very much on the design side of the fence. When you start getting into good things to do with the code, there are other avenues for that, and, and OWASP has, uh, is a great place for that, where they have their uh, code review checklist, and, and other organizations do that as well. So we're going to try to steer clear of, if you make a mistake writing the code, that's on you. Uh, we would like to think about, can we create a design in such a way that the developer cannot make a mistake in the code? Can we make the API such that there isn't a way for them to shoot themselves? Uh, we think the answer is yes. And I think if you look at the ACM paper, there's, again, anecdotal evidence that that might, in fact, be true. So threat modeling will be a...
part of this, but threat modeling is, and again, threat modeling will mean very different things to very different people. So, uh, so for me, uh, threat modeling is a way of thinking through the different parts of the system and how someone is going to attack it or how some piece of code is going to attack it and putting in the right defenses so that those attacks don't work. This will, that will be a perfectly good technique to use, but we're talking about, is there something we can do with the design? And it may not, again, we're not, we're not going to talk about threats, at least not right away, because that's, that's a couple levels deeper. So is there something we can do in the design to make it more difficult for somebody to screw up when they actually move to the coding part? So threat modeling, important piece of analysis that gets done, because it tells us where to put controls. This is going to be, this is a control to put here, and if you use it, you're safe. You're not going to use the control right. Threat modeling will tell you I need this control here. So this is not really going to address that because that, that depends on way too many things. Right? Depends on your attack surface. Depends on who, who are the threat actors you care about versus me. What are you protecting? We can't really, we can't cover that with this. At least, at least not for the near future. Yes? Can I say how they pushed it out to their group? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for what, for what we'll be doing with CSD, it will be a more global reach. And so when we get into, you know, what does this look like for a particular platform or a language? What does it look like in .NET versus this version of Spring? We leave that up to the volunteers that will take the framework description and then go apply it for a specific framework. We're not, there's, again, the, the universe of tools and tooling out there is, is too huge. But describing how to use those. Now, since Twitter did this on, for themselves internally. Um, but we still think even if we come up a level from that, we can take better descriptions and make it, you know, such that it is actionable by anybody. So anybody should be able to read the, well, not anybody, somebody with security background and knows how to code can, can maybe build a framework that your organization can use. And this way, when you start using, you know, this, this piece of software, you've got a security control that your internal experts have said, this is solid. And, and the one way that I see this even tying into some other techniques is, you know, imagine if I've got a framework that is responsible for doing, and I'm just going to pick out crypto because crypto is screwed up all the time. <clears throat> imagine you had your code review practice, and your code review practice is looking for direct calls to crypto APIs. That is actually something you can flag and immediately say, that is not allowed unless it's coming out of my crypto library, right, my crypto framework. If it's coming out of my crypto framework, then I'm more confident we're using that crypto API correctly. <clears throat> but if you're making a direct call to a crypto API in the framework, that should be a red flag. And somebody should go find out who's writing this and do they really know how to use <clears throat> this crypto API. So we can use some of these techniques and feed other parts of the SDLC to kind of protect ourselves. Well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it anyway. All right, we are at the end of our, of our time. So listen, thanks everybody for coming. And definitely uh, go, go take a look at that. If, uh, if you want to just talk offline, I'll, I'll be around for today and tomorrow. Feel free to, feel free to ping me. Thanks.